The Devil and Karl Marx, new book by Dr. Paul Kangor, published by Tan Books. Today I'm joined with Dr. Kangor to discuss this new book. Uh, Dr. Kangor is a best-selling author, professor at Grove City College in Pennsylvania. It's a wonderful college. Uh, Paul, it's, it's great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks, Zach. Yeah. Great to be on. And in prepping for this show, I wrote down I, I wrote down so many questions. Um, do you mind if we just dive right in? <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We don't, we don't we don't have to hit them all. We could we could do a part two oh, that, if you that, want to. We we'll hit what we can. I think we have about twenty five minutes. Twenty five right? minutes. We'll we'll we got to stopwatch, so we'll, we'll we'll get you out of here on time. All right. Um, <laughs> all right. Just the first one. It's a, the Devil and Karl Marx. It's, it's a provocative title, some would say. So what? What made what made you choose that title? Well, part of it, is, Zach, is that it's it's a continuation with the theme that I've done before. So my first major book was called God and Ronald Reagan that came out in 2004. And then I did a book called God and George W. Bush, who was a sitting president at the time. I even did God and Hillary Clinton. And I was asked by the publisher, which was Judith Regan's imprint at HarperCollins. Um, God and Ronald Reagan was a bestseller. I think God and George W. Bush made the bestseller list too. By the way, God and Hillary Clinton completely tanked. We, we were, uh, it was caught between, as, as we said inside with the publisher, it was caught between um, conservatives who didn't believe she believed in God and liberals who didn't care that she believed in God. And the book was translated into one language, Vietnamese wow, of all okay. things. And, I, and on the binder, there's a little red star on the thing because it translated into Vietnam. Whereas God of Ronald Reagan translated into Polish and all the you know, languages be, behind the iron curtain. But and, and they asked me to do what they called more God and books after that, basically spiritual biography. And I said, no, I turned down a couple and. I even had somebody, I guess I could say this one, in 2017 asked me to do God and Donald Trump. And and I said, no, I I, I, I don't want to do that. If, if um, we even asked him about it, we even asked Trump about it. If I had been given access, I might have, I don't know. But so this, this is kind of that theme and you're not gonna write God and Karl Marx because Marx didn't believe in God. And and the main reason the devil and Karl Marx, so that's a play on titles like the devil and Daniel Webster, and so forth. But Marx literally wrote about the devil. He wrote some really chilling poetry and even plays about the devil, about the dark side. And this, you know, Zach, this is known by people who go back quite a ways. I've gotten emails in the last few days. People usually, you know, like 60s, 70s, 80s, people who were up there saying, oh, yeah, I, I remember reading about this in Paul Johnson's book, right? I remember reading about this in Pastor uh, Richard Wormbrand. I remember reading about this in the, you know, the best-selling biography of Marx by Richard Payne in 1968, where he had a chapter called The Demons, where, and, and Payne really, he was a literary professor, literature professor. And he's the guy that found a lot of this stuff and not a not a conservative. I think probably a man of the left. But so with all of that out there, that's um, that's it. I mean, Marx wrote about the devil and this book really probably ought to be called Devil and Communism because it has a few chapters on Marx, over 100 pages on Marx. But it goes into communism generally. Um, the church, the Catholic Church, describing communism as a satanic scourge, as a product of the sons of darkness. The church used that language. I even talk about figures ranging from Saul Alinsky to Mikhail Bakunin, Walter Benjamin, Kate Millett, all people that um, people who um, some have said. Uh, you know, dabbled in the occult and, and even worse than that. So long answer to your question, no, but there you go. And so in doing research, because this is a thick book, I mean, this is close to 500, close to 500 pages. Uh, yeah, 460 pages, I think. It's about 140,000 words. Uh, and it, yeah. yeah, my book, God and Ronald Reagan, was 110,000 words. And so I did a book called The Crusader, Ronald Reagan and the Fall of Communism. That was like 140,000 words, almost identical to so this. So in doing, 
So yeah, it's um, it's a it, long it is. book, and th- yeah. it looks like it's very well documented, very well researched. So in all the research that you were putting into that book, what was one thing that was very surprising that maybe you went into the book thinking like when I was reading about Bella Dodd, I mean I was basically grew up with with understanding yeah. like okay, she testified in front of Congress, made those claims. But later on in, in your book, I think it was like chapter 10 or 11, you were talking about, no, actually she was, I think she told uh, um, Von Hildebrand, right? right. A- about that. So right. like, there's a lot of interesting things. That I was, I'm like, oh my goodness, I, I didn't know that. But you doing the research, what was like one thing that just you were surprised when you actually did the research to learn? Well, it's hard to pick one, well, it's hard to pick one thing, but I, I'd say with Bella Dodd's claims, she claimed to have placed, quote, over a thousand communist men, unquote, in Catholic seminaries. And she did that as a Communist Party member and organizer. And, you know, Zach, that's something that she was capable of doing because for the for the party, the Communist Party, she organized teachers and especially in the state of New York. And she literally organized or attempted to organize the placing of thousands of communist party members into the teachers union. So the idea to her that they could find a thousand communist men and place them among 30,000, 40,000 priests and seminarians probably seemed like a cinch. It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have seemed that difficult to her. And I walked through that in the book because I, there's, there's a lot of junk on the internet about Bella Dodd's claims and, including from fellow Catholics, right? That say, Bella Dodd did this, right? She said in her, in her blank speech, you know, Fordham, Utica, whatever, that she did this. And then I'd go and I'd check online and I'd be looking and I'd be, I'd hear the audio of the speech. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, here, here it is. Finally, here's where she talks about placing the thousand communist men. And then the audio stops and then somebody, you know, overlays text about her. And, oh, where is it? Where did she? Where did she say this? Bella said to Cong- to Congress. And, no, she didn't say it to Congress. She didn't say it to Congress. So I go through where she said it, where she might have said it, where she, we believe she might have said it. And the tricky thing about Bella Dodd is that so much of what she said has um, has never been declassified. And at the time of her death. I quote this from the congressional record. One of the congressmen who said, yeah, she told us you know, hundreds of pages of material that, that we had to redact, that we had to keep confidential. And I made a FOIA request, Zach, for her Freedom of Information Act request for her, um, for her FBI file. And it's, it's still, it, it still hasn't been released. So I, I finished this this book in that chapter, regrettably, without getting her 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 freedom, without getting her FBI file. When I when I did a book on Obama's mentor uh, Frank Marshall Davis, it's called The Communist. I had a 600 page FBI file. We we have the FBI files of Whitaker Chambers, Alger Hiss, the Rosenbergs. I go on and on and on. I Howard Zinn. But but we we still Bella Dodd still has not been released, and she died uh, what over fifty years ago. So I I really wish we had that. I'd like to see what's in it, and at the very least, um, it looks like she and the party did at least attempt to try to place uh, quote unquote over a thousand communist men in Catholic seminaries. The degree to which they succeeded. That's an open question, but at least they wanted to. That's clear. Wow. There was an intent. Yeah, and in that, I was uh, toward towards the the back half of the book. It was actually page two seventy three. It discusses the Communist Party for an axiom for organizational strategy. So, like in in so what the in the book it was saying one percent Communist Party members plus nine percent Communist Party sympathizers with well rehearsed plans of action can effectively control the remaining ninety percent. And I was just curious to, yes. if you can comment on that, because in my mind, I'm like, these guys, it seems like they have successfully infiltrated aspects of not only the Catholic Church, but it looked like just Christianity in, in general, as along with other religions. But how do they do that? So that 1% plus 9% can control the 90%. Can you just comment or just go into that a little bit further? Because that seems like a, a strong strategy. 
Yeah, it's very shrewd of you to pick up on that. I, I was thinking this morning that an op-ed that I should write would be one that pulls out from the book. I give, I think, four different examples of that. Uh, Bella Dodd, Manning Johnson, Manning Johnson, the next communist testifying before Congress, Ben Gitlow ran for president of the United States, vice president of the United States on the Communist Party USA, ex-communist testifying before Congress, Louis Boudens, who converted to Catholicism, ex-communist. I give, I think there's four different spots in the book where I quote these guys, and I've known this for years because I, I wrote a book called Dupes, boy, almost 10 years ago, which, which focused on this as well. These guys, all, all these communist ringleaders, organizers, always marveled at their ability of a handful of them to take a progressive organization, uh, take control of it, and completely control and manipulate the direction of it and push it in a pro-Soviet or pro-communist direction. And a lot of times, I've seen this so many times in my life with so many different examples. Um, I, I saw it again last week with a colleague of mine. I probably shouldn't go into detail on it. But, but, but they will, they'll see what certain leaders of an organization are doing to an organization, Zach. And you know what their response is? Oh, forget it. I'm out of here. Right? And, and, and that's exactly what the people who are, who are hijacking the organization are hoping to do. And I told this colleague of mine, I said, you know, don't walk away from the organization. Right? Stay in and try to save it. Why would you let five or six people who have made their way, wor wormed their way into this organization, take it over? Do you love, you know, organization X or not? Do you love Presbyterian Church USA or not? Do you love CPAC or not, right? Do you love the United Methodist Church or not? If you do, then don't let Harry Ward and his Me Methodist Federation for Social Action come in and hijack the United Methodist Church. Fight them, right? But people people get frustrated. They don't like the tension. They don't like the acrimony. And the communists realize, wow, just a handful of us operating very shrewdly, very wisely, and by the way, very frequently lying, right? Deceiving uh, wolves in sheep's clothing are, are really able to shape and redirect an entire organization's right. mission. So the, the, there was another part, and so this was a, just such an interesting chapter because it was um, it, it was discussing the Catholic Church. Uh, it was discussing just the infiltration in, in religion in general, which I found surprising because I thought that their target was specifically the Catholic Church, but it sounded like that that was a target. But but in general, they wanted to penetrate all of of the religions. Is uh, so the, I, I found that surprising. But the one thing, yeah, the one so thing yeah. on, it was page two eighty seven. They said Moscow, Ma Moscow ordered infiltration of the Catholic Church and Dominicans, and I, I was just curious why specifically the Dominicans were were targeted and why not another religious order. Like, what what was it about the Dominicans that was maybe a threat to them? Right, I'm not sure. I was I was, I was surprised by that too, because the Dominicans are so solid today. And the uh, I would have thought it would have been another organization, right? right. The Jesuits, right? Which, which they certainly did through liberation theology in the 1960s and 1970s. But I think that claim against the Dominicans, I think that was in the 1930s in, in that case. Yeah, I was surprised by that, too. That one doesn't really make sense to me. I quoted it, and I wonder if that person really knew what, what he was talking about. Although um, there have been a case of some radical Dominicans over the years right and and so you might know of somebody out there who's who's kind of a ripe target as the communists used to say right who's a pliable sucker they used to use that word sucker a lot and so that that's who they thus targeted um even the franciscans from from time to time but by and large they realized that the catholic church was a really formidable foe and they believe, the communists believed, that they would have much better success with the mainline denomination. So they really went after the Episcopal Church, the United Methodist Church, and Presbyterian Church USA. And those are really the three that, that went left the quickest, which is why somebody could tell you who is formerly a member of Presbyterian Church USA. I was a, you know, formerly an evangelical. So many of the people in the mainline denominations who are more orthodox 
have gone out and created non-denominational independent evangelical churches. So the, so the success or the attempt to push these churches to the left, and it doesn't have to be all the way to you know, like the Marxist left, but just to generally move them to the left, that had the effect of a lot of people in those churches over the years saying, I've had it. I'm out of here. You can have your Presbyterian church. I'm going to go join whatever, whatever. And I know others who've, who've stayed in to fight, to fight those battles. But, uh, but, that, but that's, that's who yeah. they target. And going back to uh, chapter three. So I was really interested in uh, Marx's upbringing. Um, and so I was surprised. So it sounds like the, the, the town that he grew up in was like 90% Catholic. His parents were, right. I think, Jewish, and then they converted to Lutheranism, right? That's right. Um, That's right. And then it sounded like Karl Marx did. So he he had a, a religious upbringing, but then I think you were saying that his dad would like quote Voltaire to him. Um, so he seemed like a little yeah. wacky, <laughs> his, his father. Right. But then he went to college, and it seemed like then the the wheels fell off the wagon. Uh, and he became atheist uh, some, somewhere. And I'm just trying to, do you know, what was like a, what caused that? Or like, what was the, the, the trigger point? Like, was there something very dramatic in his life that all of a sudden he's like, boom, I'm now atheist. I'm going to, you know, write this manifesto. And I know he was a, a, a poet and it sounded like some of that was leaking into his poetry early on, but like, was there like a specific event or like a trigger? Or do you think it was a combination of like just his parents, bringing him up within a somewhat religious house, but not, not so much. I, I would, um, I blame some of it on liberal Christianity, you know, kind of like Stalin going off to a seminary that was not Orthodox, but very liberal, very, um, evo- a lot of belief in evolution, very progressive, and ended up, you know, by the time he, a few years in a seminary, he no longer believed in God, of all, of all things. With, with Marx, yeah, the father converted to not Catholicism, which was the vast majority of the people in Trier, the, the, the town that, that they were born in. By the way, Trier, the, the Gothic cathedral there goes back to the 300s. The, the, the Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan. St. Ambrose, who would bring Augustine into the church, was a bishop there. St. Helena, no less than St. Helena, built that cathedral, the, the mother of Constantine, and brought back from the Holy Land the original holy robe or holy coat that, that Jesus wore to the crucifixion that the Roman soldiers cast lots for, or at least she believed that, that that's what it was. And so that's still there to this day. Most of the Jews who converted including Heinrich Marx, Marx's father's brothers. This would have been Marx's uncle. The uncle converted to Catholicism. Most of them did. But Marx's father converted to Lutheranism, which he believed, like Martin Luther, and by the way, I quote in here Marx praising Martin Luther. They liked how Luther allowed them to define their own interpretations, their own views, and their own interpretation and belief in the Bible and Scripture apart from the authority of the church. And for Marx, that break from the church as an authority was just gigantic, right? In the dialectical march of history, a key thing for Marx was, was, was to be able to say that the church doesn't have the authority to interpret scripture or it rejects the magisterial authority of the church, in effect. So Marx's father was a, was a pretty liberal Lutheran. And who kind of cast around and was free with his beliefs, passed that along to Carl. And then by the time Carl was in was in college at the University of Bonn, he had a professor named Dr. Bruno Bauer. Oh, here's another classic example. A liberal atheist at a German university teaching courses on systematic theology, right? You know, Catholic parents listening right now, how many of you are going to say, oh, Johnny's okay at that liberal college? He's taking a course on theology. <laughs> Who do you think's teaching it? C.S. Lewis? I mean, come on, right? I, I, and, and I, I had one parent say, um, I, and I, I said, how's that course going? Well, not very well. The professor's an atheist. So, well, yeah. 
Of course. Of course. You think they're going to let Bishop Robert Barron teach the course? I mean, come on. So he he connected with this atheist professor, Dr. Bruno Bauer. And by 1841, Marx would have been 23 years old. Young Marx is helping his professor found a journal called the Archives of Atheism. So it didn't it didn't take long once he got into college for him to make a, a complete and total break from from uh, from his from his Christian religious faith. Wow, that's that's amazing. Um, and we just to let you know, a time check. We got five minutes, Paul. And I, I'm <laughs> so huh? let me uh, get. Well, we could wrap up with maybe one more question, and maybe we can do a part two in that, this series, maybe next week or the week after, maybe that, a regular that, that series. That would be awesome. Um, okay, the one one kind of question is, is that it seems that many young people are attracted to socialism, communism, Marxism, and why why do you think that is? And also, can you also help define, really, maybe it's for me, I'm sure the audience already knows that the definitions between socialism, communism, and then even like uh, Marxist communism versus maybe like atheistic communism, like there's distinctions, it seems, between those. So like question 1A is, why do you think younger people are, are attracted to this? And question... Well, it's all related. Yeah, I can tell you because they, they're attracted to it because they don't know this stuff what they've learned. And in fact, you can see this, Zach, in different surveys. They'll say, um, I approve of communism, right? I prefer socialism over capitalism. And then, then some of the surveys, there haven't been many that have done this, but if you have, we'll say, okay, how do you define communism? How do you define socialism? And they don't say, well, like it says in the Communist Manifesto, abolition of all private property. <laughs> Abolition of the family. I support those things, right? Abolition of all religion. Now they say, well, it's about being kind to one another. It's about sharing. It's about helping your fellow man. It's about redistributing money from the from the filthy rich to the to the poor, right? They they they, they, they don't understand it. And and if if they read books like this and they knew things like this, they'd reject it immediately. In fact, if they just read the Communist Manifesto, they'll reject it. Right. But it doesn't take long to 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 read to read the Communist Manifesto. And you see today a lot of young people saying, well, I'm not a communist. I'm a socialist. Right. Or I'm a democratic socialist. I walk through that very carefully in the book. According to Marxist theory, history, the dialectic of history would go from slavery, feudalism to capitalism, to socialism, to communism. So socialism was the final transitionary step to communism. And Marx, Engels, and Lenin all spoke favorably of democracy. In fact, I was looking up yesterday, the statue of Lenin that was just erected in Germany, of all places, uh, this, you know, this dimwit who they're qu quoting from Germany saying, oh, Lenin was a champion of democracy. And people reading that probably with any knowledge of one are like, are you out of your mind? But I can tell you this, uh, Lenin actually did write favorably of democracy, but the way that Lenin defined democracy isn't how we see it. He's not thinking like Madison and Jefferson and Washington. To him, and he even says democracy means equality. All right. And his version of equality was economic equality, class equality. So uh, I, I even quote Bernie Sanders on this. You have to ask these socialists, democratic socialists and Marxists, what do you mean by democracy? And you got to really push them because if they truly genuinely understand it, the people who do indeed understand it, they're not going to want to give you an honest answer yeah. on it. Well, Paul, th thank you so much for your time today, and um, I, I, if I, I would like to take you up on a, a, a part two of, of, of this show. Um, yeah, let's do it. We, we let's let's yeah, get it that, scheduled. Maybe in a couple great. weeks. Thank you so much, um, and we're right on time. It's eleven fourteen, so we we have a minute to spare. Okay, <laughs> all right. I got a bolt. All right, off to save <laughs> the world. Good. Thank you very much, Paul. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. Thanks.